designed a ski slope on top of a waste energy plant for a couple of years ago in Copenhagen. And basically, the suddenly something that was meant to be the kind of back, backyard of the city, if you will, of the back of house of the city, suddenly become a new destination, a new park, and something that everybody feels proud of. Jarg Engels Group, um, also B-I-G or simply big, I guess, right? Uh, is really one of the major architectural firms in the world, have done projects everywhere. In New York, one of their early flagship projects was West 57th Street. We'll get to hear about that. And also about some other projects as well. Now, uh, the, the, the firm is really based in Copenhagen and in, uh, in New York, so in Denmark and in the United States. Now, uh, Daniel was trained as an architect. He's actually Swedish originally, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He studied in Sweden. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Sweden and Denmark. Sweden. <laughs> Worked actually in Copenhagen for a while, but now has been based in New York for, I don't know, 12 years or so. Uh, and um, welcome, Daniel. Uh, it's really great to have you. And why don't we get started uh, with some uh, introduction about the firm and some, some projects so that we have a broader context of what uh, what big is doing thank you that was uh, a great introduction and uh, i'm really excited to be a part of this conversation today and meet with you all um i so i have a few uh, shares to uh, or a few slides to share uh let's see here if i can just bring this up uh, so yeah, th thank you everyone for uh, for uh, participating in this conversation today. Uh, I'm going to share a few uh, slides, but I was thinking uh, share to start off by sharing uh, a sort of a diagram showing how we as a, a design firm are thinking about the world, but also thinking about our approach to design. And essentially, where we start off usually when we design a building is to start to think about is there any new connections within the built environment that we can consider in this project and by doing so not only improve the performance of architecture and design but also improve the experience essentially looking at every project that we do through the lens of a ecosystem uh, and just kind of a short introduction. Yeah, uh, Bernd already shared. We have a few more offices uh, that popped up in the last couple of years uh, throughout the world. We, we have a series of different uh, expertise in-house. We are becoming more and more a kind of a multidisciplinary practice. And I'll come back to that later. We're 23 partners uh, uh, globally and around 600 uh, employees. Uh, is, you can see uh, uh, the office behind me, but this is a, a kind of another view just showing how uh, uh, physical models, despite the kind of digital uh, world, physical models are still, in my mind, one of the best tools to, to uh, share an experience around design. Uh, and, and this is just showing also uh, we are, uh, as an architect, you're, you're, you're today involved in a great variety of, of uh, projects. Uh, we are today looking at uh, projects from the scale, scale of a light bulb, which is a product design that we did. Uh, it's called Bulb of Fiction, is, if anyone is interested. Uh, so we're doing everything from products to landscape to architecture and master plans, uh, as well as regional master plans. So it's, it's kind of a, a big range of of different design tasks that we are occupied with. And every product we're really trying to make sure that there is, that we exhaust every opportunity. Essentially, we're spending actually most of our time doing research and exploring uh, different ideas. And, and throughout the design process, we make sure that, that we inform uh, every product with as much intelligence as we can. And this is just like a broad range of, of uh, recently uh, finished projects. Uh, uh, and you know we, we're not, uh, we, we're not uh, like experts in one kind of architecture. Uh, we really see every product as an opportunity to, to find new ways of, of resolving uh, 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 all the problems. 
and and uh, so this is a range of of, of, uh, uh, of products from museums to schools to residential buildings uh, to to art galleries uh, to public harbor baths. So we really enjoy the 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 kind of spectrum of design as it's presented to us. Uh, and I wanted to share three projects that means a lot to me personally. I've been involved in all these projects recently. And one of them is the reason why uh, I moved to New York uh, with, with the kind of dream to make Manhattan a, a little bit more human. Uh, and uh, Bernd mentioned this, but perhaps some of you have, have seen uh, this building. It's called Via. Uh, it's on the West 57th Street. Uh, and essentially, uh, we got presented with a site uh, that was roughly uh, uh, the same size as a classic Scandinavian courtyard and also the same uh, uh, proportions as the uh, uh, Central Park. Uh, the client was uh, uh, or is uh, Douglas Durst, a New York developer. And we started out this project in, in Copenhagen, actually. and, and uh, Bjarke called me up one day and said, we're moving to New York uh, to, to start a new office. Uh, this was back in 2010. And we thought, what can we bring to New York? Uh, new York is obviously a tower or a city of, of uh, towers. Uh, and, and coming from Europe, where the courtyard typology is really a dominating way to, to build architecture. And there's a good reason for it. And that is that the courtyard uh, basically becomes the the heart of each block and it's the place where everybody meet and enjoy uh, uh, the outdoors and the life uh, together uh, and we thought what if we could combine the idea of a skyscraper with the idea of a courtyard uh, and essentially looking at uh, the placing a courtyard on the site uh, and then essentially just by pulling up one corner and pulling down two corners, the design ended up being what we refer to as a court scraper, the, the, the marriage of a courtyard and a skyscraper. Uh, and you essentially uh, create the lower portion towards the south and the higher tower portion towards the north. So you have the sun as it uh, uh, kind of follows the the sky dome over the, the course of a day, you essentially have a sunlight coming to the courtyard and you also provide views out to the water. Uh, so this project was completed in, in 2015 uh, and this is uh, how, how it looks uh, in the city context from New Jersey. It's very striking. Uh, and you can see how the, all the little kind of openings create this kind of balconies uh, and that also have a function that, that uh, as you have a, a very kind of constrained site with West Side Highway, you actually have a sanitation plant to the south and uh, all the uh, kind of uh, uh, power plant to the north. So we really needed to create a kind of an oasis here. Uh, and each uh, terrace, we call them cockpits because they're essentially sunk in, into the facade. And it means that you uh, uh, don't, uh, hear as much uh, noise from the adjacent uh, highways. Uh, and this is just some views. And you can see it almost has these kind of sail-like qualities as you move around. Uh, this is kind of looking up uh, at the uh, facade. And this is from the neighboring building. And this is really important because the, uh, the same developer owned the tower behind. And as you can see with this dramatic design, we pushed the entire a tower portion to the south to keep the views from, from the tower behind. So it, it, it kind of, again, this idea of being a friendly neighbor is, is somehow a better strategy in the long run. Uh, can I just stop a uh, step in for a moment, Daniel? I think you answered the question from the chat. Actually, it wasn't a question. It was ah, okay. Comment. Sorry, I, I don't see anything. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so, so I'll, I'll let you know. So Libya was writing in the chat. Beautiful building, but hated by many on the Upper West Side because it takes away light and obstructs the view. But what you just told us is actually, uh, it does not obstruct the view that uh, substantially from the neighborhood buildings. Uh, is, is that correct? No, that's correct. I mean, the, the, unless you live in the, uh, in the old power plant, but 
it, it's uh, built to allow for as much sunlight as, as possible. Uh, and of course, the asymmetrical uh, tower makes it uh, smaller towards the top and, and then it kind of grows towards the bottom. Um, and, and again, this is just showing uh, some of the amenities. So everywhere you are, we have daylight. And of course, also placing the courtyard in the middle of the building allows for a less deep uh, uh, podium. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, again, just a few examples. This is the, if, if you want to stay up uh, late night and do some gambling. Uh, so you can see here, each unit also have uh, either views towards the outside or views towards this courtyard. Uh, so this is one of the uh, ground floor units that is usually uh, kind of the, the least desirable. Suddenly have your own uh, outdoor uh, patio uh, with, with the uh, kind of uh, all uh, uh, greenery outside. Uh, so, so you can see here uh, standing in the communal courtyard and uh, how it kind of tears up uh, towards the views. And it's really designed as a little, uh, yeah, as a, a little oasis in the city. Yeah, looks like it. I mean, this is really human human Hatton or whatever you called it, right? So exactly. really fabulous <laughs> example. We, we have a couple of other examples as well, do we, right? We do have a couple of other examples. Uh, other examples. Uh, so I'll move through it quickly, but you can see how everything comes down to a kind of a viewing platform. We call it a Titanic moment. Uh, but here you can really see how all the green uh, coming together. Uh, and I'm gonna dive into the second uh, project. Um, called the dry line. So uh, after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, uh, 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 I was actually in the middle of uh, the so-called SOPO uh, district, south of power. I don't know if some of you might have been in the city, but it was quite traumatic. Uh, and afterwards, we were asked by the Obama Recovery Fund to look at a integrated flood protection system around the city, uh, but instead, uh, uh, of finding inspiration in uh, kind of traditional engineered uh, solutions, we looked at the High Line, uh, which is uh, uh, the second most popular uh, park in New York. And I also find it really fascinating how a piece of old infrastructure can turn into a uh, programmed amenity uh, for the city. So we were thinking, how can we basically learn from the High Line and learn from the people of New York to program a new type of flood protection along the southern tip. This is where this was the most uh, kind of vulnerable, this is where the most vulnerable communities uh, live. So we basically looked at every community and, and uh, uh, tailored a specific design to them. Uh, and the first two, uh, uh, 2.3 uh, miles are actually under construction today. Uh, this is under the, the you see the uh, Williamsburg Bridge in the foreground. So this is essentially an elevated park with, with uh, better connections back to the community, which was a big uh, part of this process. It's, it's uh, under construction, as you can see, uh, this is the first uh, kind of flood walls uh, going in. And, and, and this is kind of the, the a vision as a whole coming together on the southern tip uh, uh, of Manhattan. Uh, so being on the water and, and being kind of uh, living or working on waterfront projects led us to the, the last project I'm going to share, which is uh, uh, kind of looking at what if we're actually moving onto the water and can we find sustainable, self-sustainable uh, can we build self-sustainable neighborhoods on the water? Uh, so we have been working on a project together with the United Nations here in New York, the UN Habitat, to develop a prototype for uh, coastal cities. New York is one of them that, that definitely are uh, at risk uh, for rising seas and uh, 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 large uh, storm events. Uh, around the city, you have different cities with similar issues. Miami is one of them that are literally uh, sinking into the water. Venice is a very famous example. Uh, but what I find really interesting is that uh, today, a lot of clients are looking for a more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, triple bottom line. 
is not only the financial targets, uh, but also environmental and social uh, targets. So we have, uh, throughout this process, doing a project like this, really learning from communities, understanding how people and nature organize themselves, uh, and, and taking from that uh, kind of uh, uh, sources of knowledge and, and uh, basically building a design uh, around uh, uh, the systems that we rely on to live our lives. And kind of, again, understanding the synergies between all these different systems and the spatial impact and the flow impact and see how you can essentially design a floating platform and thinking about being on the water, what that means in terms of moving around and what kind of opportunities are there to, to uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, grow your own food and create your own energy. Uh, so uh, just kind of, again, looking at all kind of different type of architecture that can go on these platforms, thinking about wood construction, which we do see is a, is a kind of a big, uh, uh, it's on the rise in terms of, of uh, uh, kind of sustainable building materials. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to finish off here showing that this system could allow for a great variety of, of uh, different type of architectural and design solutions. Uh, and then again, the idea of a floating platform is really interesting because you essentially create a hull where you can put a lot of the services that you uh, normally uh, put outside of your buildings. Uh, and finally, what is really interesting is that normally the infrastructure of a city is disassociated with the neighborhoods where people live. Uh, but this kind of gap means that a lot of the, a, a, a lot of the, the uh, uh, growing of cities is depending, uh, dependent on growing of infrastructure somewhere else. Uh, and a lot of the issues that we're facing is associated with this gap or lag, if you will. Uh, but here we really have the opportunity to think three-dimensionally and kind of building in all the systems uh, to create a, a completely uh, self-sustainable uh, neighborhood and even grow your own uh, uh, food, uh, as well as opportunities to uh, clean the, the water below you as well. Uh, and just to give you a sense of scale of this project, um, uh, this is the scale of Manhattan. And of course, since you're on water, you can essentially uh, grow as much as you, you like. And, and the beauty of it is that you're not only growing habitats for people, but also these platforms will become uh, a habitat for, for uh, sea life as well. Uh, so uh, just to finish off a few uh, slides showing what this could look like. Uh, and, and of course, you can see that all the buildings are kind of covered in solar panels. And, and the reason why there are only four or five stories is that you, uh, in order to provide your own energy, you need a certain surface area. And that is usually uh, equal uh, one to one. So the amount of area you occupy, you usually need the same amount of solar panels. Uh, take or give depending on where you live on, on planet Earth. Uh, but, but we really envision this uh, concept to be adaptable to different uh, climates and, and different uh, cultures. And hopefully one day, perhaps even here in our own backyard in New York, uh, a, a winter, a cold winter day, you could uh, uh, live on the ocean. I'm, I'm, I just have a little video, I hope it's not too uh, shoppy. Uh, but that's my my last uh, 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 slide. And I apologize. There was a lot of slides here, but uh, uh, yeah, let's 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 uh, open up for a conversation. Uh, but here you see how it's it's uh, uh, the kind of idea of, of a future where water uh, becomes a bigger part of our way of of uh, moving around, uh, and and by doing so. Uh, you also have a, a greater opportunity to, to uh, uh, become a part of, of the, the infrastructure and the aspects of the society that you normally might not uh, interact with. Yeah, thank you for sharing these projects. I think it was really important so that we get a sense of 
the architectural firm and what you do and yeah. the, the key concept sort of behind it. Maybe you can stop sharing. Um, yeah. I'd like to get more generally now to sort of the, I don't know, let me call it architectural philosophy that yeah, is yeah. behind uh, uh, your firm and the principles. And I'd like to uh, sort of discuss it in, 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 in three layers, okay? Uh, one layer would be the idea of experience, then which you mentioned. Uh, the second one would be the notion of environment or habitat, or let me call it ecosystem, also a term that you've used. And the last one would be sort of social. So let's take each in its term, and I understand that they are interconnected, but take experience. Um, I've written a lot on experience, on experience marketing, created the term experiential marketing and customer experience management. This was like, I don't know, 15 years ago, but nowadays the term is everywhere. You know, all the retailers are creating experiences. There's the online experience, there's the user experience, there's the educational experience, all that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, in architecture, I think what we are also seeing more and more is, let me call it experiential architecture, right? I mean, clearly differentiated from architecture that is purely functional, Bauhaus style. Now that's really the old stuff, right? There has been a development with postmodernism and so on for many years in the direction, of, I mean, away from this functionality or pure functionality. But I think what you've shown us is also, and I would like to hear your view on that, whether, whether you agree, is very much about experiential architecture. So, so, so is that one of your uh, philosophies and, and, and principles of, of, of doing architecture within the firm? Yeah, I mean, one, uh, and, and I think one uh, important kind of uh, point of departure is really that I, I do believe that there is a, a, a big difference between uh, opening the door and, and uh, the, or opening the door for somebody and actually invite somebody. And I think design have that power to, it, something that is well designed is something that people feel excited about kind of uh, approaching and, and enter and be a part of. Something that is badly designed is something that even though it might have good intention, it's uh, something that people don't want to uh, you know, uh, 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 interact with. So, so a lot of emotions, emotions play into architecture as well, don't they? Not just uh, utility. Oh, 100%. It's, it's a, you know, a, uh, the, actually, one of the first things you learn in architect school is that you know a, a tall ceiling makes people feel uplifted, and a low ceiling makes you feel uh, uh, oppressed. Uh, so, so, I mean, it, it's uh, it's it, it it is very physical. The physical and the kind of uh, um, emotional are very intertwined uh, when you design architecture. But I was going to say that that uh, uh, in, so I, I I think to to um, we're in each product. We're trying to make sure that that the this, the design that we're playing with, and not only uh, uh, functions for the client, uh, but also there there is a moment of inviting the public or inviting people. Uh, I do strongly believe great cities are about experiments, are about mixing people, and we all uh, love New York and and perhaps. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a love-hate relationship for sure, uh, but but there is something about the mix and there's something about the uncertainty that that uh, makes up uh, great cities. Uh, and we uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, we designed a ski slope on top of a waste energy plant for a couple of years ago in Copenhagen, and basically the suddenly something that was meant to be the kind of back, backyard of the city, if you will, of the back of house of the city, suddenly become a new destination, a new park, and something that everybody feels proud of. Uh, and what is also interesting is you go skiing on the roof of this building, uh, but at the same time, you get curious about, you know, about ways and about, you know, uh, making the city more clean. Uh, so I think design have, so much power to actually, uh, yeah, change the perception of what is possible when you uh, think about new uh, cities and new neighborhoods. Yeah, we are already at the level of the environment now and the ecosystem, uh, yeah. which I think is also a, a clear design principle uh, in your firm. And it also relates to one of the questions here that is asked from the participants. Uh, how does the floating platform affect 
uh, marine life, the floating platform that you showed us, um, and how do you make sure that it's not being damaged and altered? No, it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, there is a long answer to it, but but also a short answer that. that Let, let's go for the short answer. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but it is a great question, and it's something we started a lot. And uh, you you basically place the platforms where you have a certain depth. And what happens is when you have shallow structures, it attracts marine life uh, because they can live on it, they can feed on it. So the platforms will be designed to essentially house uh, 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 corals and algae. And over time, it will essentially become a floating uh, reef, if you will. Uh, and another interesting aspect is that you, the, the moorings uh, that you basically uh, connect the platforms to the bottom of the, the, the ocean or the bottom of the water, they would also become, uh, over time, uh, artificial reefs. And then you can essentially move the platform. So you could almost, over time, build artificial reefs using the presence uh, of, of uh, people and the presence of the platforms. Right. So, so there was a lot of thinking actually put into, uh, into that marine life aspect of the no, absolutely. We're we're uh, uh, we, we're working with a large team uh, uh, of consultants that that are a part of this project, uh, and we're actually in the process of building our fir first prototype uh, uh, as we speak, and the location will be disclosed uh, next week. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. All right, you can hear New York in the background here, right? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, and and that relates to another question: the social aspects of um, of design and of architecture. Uh, you know, we have a question here that says, "What are the socioeconomic implications, especially of the last project that you showed us?" And I guess this idea of not just the the, the let's say sustainable environment is important to you, but also the the social impact of your projects, right? Yeah, no, that, that uh, that's also a great question, and we have a lot of conversations about this both. Uh, kind of uh, uh, holistically, but also uh, project specific. Uh, and uh, the affordable component is really important. Uh, so we're, we're always trying to find ways to make building technologies more efficient, more simple, uh, passive technologies. So these floating platforms, for example, you have uh, a cross ventilation opportunities to bring down costs for energy and bring down costs for systems. So really thinking smart about how you're building buildings, how you operate buildings, how you maintain buildings, all this is cost that adds up. Uh, so making uh, architecture that people can afford is something that we're really, um, uh, yeah, but it, it's very important for us. And, we're always trying to find ways to be smarter about this. And then the other aspect is, of course, also that you want to make sure that there is a mix of people uh, and, and different type of offerings and different scales of apartments. So if you want to move between different units uh, and if you are uh, kind of growing your family, you want to make sure that there is that opportunity to stay in the same neighborhood. A huge issue that you have in New York and other cities is that that people that 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 want to maybe stay in the same neighborhood they don't there is no um, opportunities for them to stay because there is no apartments that fit their needs. Uh, so the mix of different type of apartment, the mix of different cost uh, groups uh, is is uh, a key to to successful projects and successful neighborhoods and ultimately right. successful cities. I mean, obviously, not just a uh, not just a challenge for architects, but for uh, city planning more broadly, and for government and 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 all of that. Um, now, the the last sort of um, buzzword that I want to throw at you: one was experience, the other one was ecosystem. Is is again this this social idea? And most recently, we've gone through, or we still are, sort of in the pandemic, right? Uh, how has that sort of changed your view of design? Uh, Patricia is asking here about people's needs and also especially safety needs. Uh, are you designing differently than you did like, I don't know, three years ago? Yeah, no, I mean, the, it, it's a great question. Of course, we are more conscious about 
how people relate to each other. I do think that that we, I think for you know things have been changing really fast. And for a year ago, when we were in the middle of it, we saw a lot of interest from clients to obviously think about a more virtual world. And what is interesting is the design of offices uh, have not changed significantly, but the thinking around homes have changed significantly. So we see more uh, 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 clients or developers are asking for you know, uh, office spaces inside of your home and making sure that there is a space where you can work from home if you, if you want to. Uh, but, and, and then in general, just, you know, uh, being mindful about dimensions and making sure that there is space for people to move around. But I will say the biggest change is really when you're thinking about the role of the home and uh, making sure that you can, uh, 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 if, if you're two people living at home, you want to make sure that somebody, that both of you can kind of have a comfortable uh, um, way of, of kind of interacting with other people. Um, and I'm sure uh, m most of you are probably either with families running around and you're trying to have conference calls or, or uh, living yeah. in a studio. Uh, it's, a, it's a social experiment on many levels. Uh, but, yeah, but I, was think, I was thinking that how the home and how home design might have to change now that people will be, not only because of the pandemic, but because of broader work, work life changes as well, will be spending more time at home working, right? Or yeah. want to have their offices look more and more like home. I mean, you know, the, the ping pong tables and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I think there is more of a convergence in terms of design between these two um, places, right? I mean, the first place and the second place, I think the sociologists used to call it in the third place is always Starbucks. So uh, Daniel, uh, do you see like um, some thinking in architecture firms around this idea of home and workplace coming closer together? A hundred percent. And one thing, uh, and, and your uh, uh, observation is uh, perfectly correct. Like the, 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 there is a trend that, that's been going on for a while, of course, to make offices uh, feel more home-like. Uh, and of course, on the other side, uh, make homes um, more a space where you can do a great, greater variety of, of things. Uh, and I think you see it in the sense that that like we we've been working on, for example, uh, in our first prototype uh, for the floating cities, we are looking into mixing uh, uh, workspaces and hospitality, essentially hotel rooms in the same space as you have uh, uh, research uh, spaces. So we do see a kind of uh, architectural alchemy, if you will. Uh, more kind of uh, brave ideas, how you can mix things that for just a, a couple of years ago seemed completely nuts. Uh, so we can also see that the uh, amenities are changing in residential products. Uh, so obviously uh, the kind of communal spaces becomes more important as a kind of a second living room or second workplace. Mm. And I, I find it interesting also that the paradox in all this is that people somehow have become more and more accustomed to share their private life with others. Uh, and, and I do see that that's going to have more and more uh, impact on how we, uh, we design our environments. Um, right. And at the same time, we are bringing in environments into our Zoom presence as well, right? No, no, <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. Virtual environments. No, but that's the thing, like you, you somehow get to know people on a different level. I find it really kind of fascinating. Also, the fact that you're uh, normally the dynamics in a meeting room, you have people sitting in the front and people sitting in the back. And there is this hierarchy. But on a Zoom call, you're all kind of the entire team and the entire group is uh, uh, kind of, uh, the, everybody have the same kind of presence in the digital uh, room. Uh, yeah. so, so I, I find that- I mean, fascinating changes from, uh, at the personal level between um, uh, you know home and, and, and workspace or office, uh, then at the level of real and virtual at a sort of mid-level scale of how we are looking at the world. And then when we are in a city, in a big city like New York City, um, there are big changes as well in terms of where people want to live. When we uh, uh, spoke before, Daniel, there was this 
a, a notion of like in the old days, you know, everything was feeding into Manhattan, right? Because that's where you go to work, for example. And then the subways go in and out of Manhattan, basically. That's how the, the whole system is being constructed. Now uh, they are planning a subway that goes north south in Brooklyn, Queens, right? Um, and, 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 and similar issues like that. So thank you very, very much, uh, Daniel. We are out of time. A fascinating conversation. This was Daniel Sundlin, a partner from Bjark Ingels Group, also called Big. So I'll pass it back to Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.